Hello fellow travelers of Sanctuary, it is Ebontis here, and in this video I just want to cover some basics. Um, and these are just tips I've found from playing by myself with friends, seeing what other videos have said, kind of had some oops on my own kind of situations. Just stuff I've figured out as we go through. I'm towards the end of the campaign, so this is not in-game. This is not a full build video for any certain character. This is just general tips about the game that are going to make your experience a little bit smoother all the way through and kind of help you spend your time as best as possible as you work your way um, through all of Sanctuary. Because this game is huge and there's a lot to experience, but doing it in not even like the most efficient way. You do not have to be like full, like, you know, do this exact thing here, here, and here, and here. Just trying to smooth around the edges make things better, and hopefully by the time you get to the end of the campaign, you're sitting in a pretty happy place, and you know you've got a lot more to do as well. So, let's jump in. Now, the first thing I want to say, I played a rogue, but it doesn't really matter that much. All the characters have some pluses and minuses to them. Literally, just figure out which one sounds fun to you, and then just know that's the playstyle you're going to be. I played a rogue. I've got some agility. I've got some dodging moves. Barbarian, you're going to be a little slower, but tankier, and you're going to be up there beating the crap out of stuff with, you know, giant two-handed weapons and things like that. Do you want to cast spells as a wizard? That's your sorcerer. Druid, do you want to turn into a possible wolf or bear, but also cast, like, moon spells or whatever it's going to be? You've got an option of kind of both ways to go there. Definitely some benefits to both. Do you want to be a necromancer with an army of the dead? There's literally just like, there's cool things about every character, and I think they did a really good job in making all the characters very viable in different ways. Now, I cover like specking and abilities and stuff like in the end in a general aspect. The biggest thing is I can say, if you play through the whole campaign, and even if you like kind of fall out of love with the character, it's still not the end of the world. So just pick one, have fun, enjoy the story, mess around with abilities if you want to, you'll get some cool gear. But other than that, just don't stress about your character choice too much. You're going to have some flexibility in the future. All right, world tiers. As you're leveling up, uh, you're not going to get to Nightmare until you basically beat the campaign. Unlocked by completing the campaign and Cathedral of Light Capstone Dungeon in Kyovishad. So and you have to beat that at world tier 2. So you got to beat the campaign before you get to 3 or 4, which is all the crazy stuff. Now... One and two is what you're going to be deciding between when you start. I've been going through on tier one, and honestly, it's what I recommend for everybody. Main difference is 15% more gold. I don't know if you're ever going to notice. I'm sitting at plenty of gold, uh, and I'll kind of give you a few tips on where to not spend that stuff. But generally, gold, not an issue that I'm worried about. And the 20% more increased experience probably balances itself out because the enemies are more challenging. If it takes me 10 seconds to kill an enemy here and 20 seconds to kill an enemy here, which nothing takes you quite that long, but some are chunkier. But if it takes you twice as long to kill an enemy and you're only getting 20 more experience, killing more enemies in the long run, probably going to make it all right. So I recommend, honestly, for most of your campaign, pay campaign playthrough and all of this, is to play it tier one. So that's kind of one of those things that's going to be an easier path, but not too easy. I've died a few times but also going to keep your pacing of your story moving forward. Your fights are going to be a bit more reasonable, probably have less deaths on certain fights. So you're not just like beating your head against the wall. Then when you want to get the crazy stuff down here, yeah, go for it. Notice hundred percent more experience. They're more formidable, uh, more gold. They monsters overcome 20% resistance. Like there are challenges that are waiting for you if you want to get there, but if you want to have a good smooth experience, and honestly, the benefits to Tier 2 just don't seem to be worth it, in my opinion, so I recommend Tier 1. Now, this may sound obvious, but it's actually easy to miss. These little icons here are waypoints. These blue ones, if you haven't clicked on them yet, they have the same symbol, but they're gray. Now, if I get to a small town, big town, whatever it may be, and I'm like, okay, so I'm in Margrave, da-da-da-da-da, talking to people, interacting with vendors, vendors, picking up quests, whatever it may be. But if I don't actually walk over to this thing and actually click on it, then you won't have activated. Then you're going to go marching halfway across the map doing something else, and you want to go back there to turn in the quest, you have to walk back if you did not click on it. So please make sure anytime you get near a waypoint, click on it. Make sure you activate it. And actually, to help you with that, it's going to be in my next tip, which is going to be about an online map. Now you'll notice this is the map of Kyovishad. I spent plenty of time here and I'll cover that in a little while, but these are called Altars of Lilith. Now, all they do is give you literally a plus two to a stat. 
but it is a plus two to a stat on every character. So there's like 160 of these things in the game or something like that. So every one that you pick up, you don't have to pick it up on any other character in the future. And when you do make a new character, you won't be able to tell like these that are grayed out that I've already got. You won't know. So to have a good checklist and be able to find them all on your first main character, I recommend using an online map. The one I'm using is d4builds.gg and then slash map. But if you get to that website, you'll find it. And you can even click on those as you go through. Now, I have a second monitor, so I play it that way. If you have an iPad, whatever, second screen, I highly, highly recommend playing with a map because it's also going to show you where waypoints are. If you're close to one and you're like, oh, I made it up to I made it up to here. And then, you know, it's like, hey, there's a waypoint here that, you know, you can grab. Go grab it. And then you've got more fast travel points opened up. So using the map for that is built online. Shout out to the people who made these maps. They're freaking fantastic usually. I highly, highly recommend you doing that. Now, the other reason I say picking up the Altars of Lilith is, say I'm in Kyobashad, and I need to head down this direction. I'm like, okay. Well, between here and there, there's not a ton. But instead of going from Kyobashad down here, what if I make a little detour, grab this Altar of Lilith, and then go down here? And then if I'm roaming around this area, and I know I've got this one and this one to pick up, then as I run around... You know, maybe I t make a small detour. So maybe I'm going from Yelesna up here to the Bear Tribe Forge. Well, maybe I like make a bit of a detour and go around and pick up the Altars of Lilith on the way. Now, you are going to get a mount, so picking them up, them up later will be faster. But I mean, if it's not a huge detour, like if I'm going from here to, say, like this dungeon, for example, for whatever reason, which you probably wouldn't. But if I'm going here to here, and if I just go around the other way and grab an Altar of Lilith and maybe a small detour, and then I grab it... That's the type of stuff I recommend. I don't recommend, like, if you have to go from Kyovashad to Yelesna and then go pick up the one that's way up here. If you end up near one and you're looking around on your map on your second screen, you're like, hey, there's one not too far by, pick it up. That's all I'm saying. Then when you get your mount, I recommend picking them all up on your main character because it's easier to tell which ones you do and don't have. But as for Altars of Lilith on the map, that is a great way to use it. So please make sure you do. So D2 builds... Dot gg that's your map and then altars of lilith make sure you get as many of those as you can that are reasonably around as you run through and do the story now the next thing for the map is this little pin you can put it damn near anywhere which is great but it's actually really beneficial now if i put a pin and i'm in a party they can see the pin what they're not going to see is this path it draws and this path actually carries over to your mini map so you'll notice if i go wandering off the wrong direction the little red line on the minimap is going to tell me which way I should be going to make a faster way. And it's going to adjust like real live GPS is going to be like, okay, go this way now. So the little red map line is extremely helpful. That way you're not going here. Pay, okay, I got to go over here. You come up here and then I got to go over here. Just plop a pin on the map and the little red line will guide you the entire way. And use your minimap because it's going to be extremely helpful. So... Yeah, I cannot recommend dropping a pin where you're going. Like, if I need to go where a quest is and I need to go here, like, it's going to show me the entire path to get there and I can just follow it the whole way. So use that and it's going to be really helpful. And if you've got teammates that are with you, drop a couple pins, all going to be all together and you guys will march together. So that way people don't get lost. It's very helpful. The next thing I'm going to mention is Renown. Now, you can see in Kyovashad that I did a lot of stuff. Now, I haven't done nearly everything, but I did a decent amount. Altars of Lilith, um, Dungeons sellers side quests the campaign itself um strongholds all of these are going to give you something called renown and renown you'll notice up top i'm 1245 of 2490 so i'm not even i'm about halfway there and i spent a pretty good amount of time in this zone so you're gonna have a lot more to do i've got some side quests to turn in which is fine but this is your renown and what it's going to do is for one it's going to let you see i have 25 and 28 altars of lilith side dungeons haven't done that many uh, the renown value is 30, areas discovered is 5, so every side dungeon is 30 renown. Strongholds are worth 100. If you ever need a jump in renown, go to a stronghold. They're not that long, and they're definitely worth giving you a bump. If you're like, I'm a good chunk away, but I know I can probably get up to my next tier, one stronghold will get me there, cool. Another reason to get waypoints, they're worth renown as well. Side quests a little bit, altars of Lilith are 10. Side dungeons, there's a lot, so... You don't need to do them all, and I'll kind of cover pacing and stuff here in a second. But the big thing you get 
if you get to tier one, you're going to get some XP and gold. Each character can claim that. Notice it's claimed by each character. The bottom one is the important one. Unlocks for all characters that you ever that you create. A skill point for tier one, very beneficial to have an extra skill point. The potion capacity, especially if you're playing by yourself, getting into some of the later stuff, playing difficult things. This is going to be something you're going to want to unlock on every single zone. Like the Paragon points, these two you have to get to World Tier 3, so you got to beat the campaign before you ever get there. So if you get up to Tier 3, you're basically, you should be done with the zone. You don't need to overkill it. Um, but the bonus gold, like 10,000 gold, cool. Bonus XP, cool. But the potion capacity, even better. The bonus XP and gold is great. Another skill point, cool. Now, what I recommend when it comes to pacing, I'll cover in a second. But my goal for each zone, approximately Tier 2, because the potion capacity... That's the one I personally care about as a solo player, keeping myself alive. So when you do Renown, these are all the ways to find it. And for me, if I'm like just in a zone, I'm not sure what the button is on console, but on PC, you can see up top where it's like Fractured Peaks, Undiscovered, you know, area or here, Frigid Expanse, all the different options on the right. It says W View Rewards. That's where the screen comes from. Every so often, pop in here and you'll claim it. But yeah, the potion capacity, very helpful. And that's from Renown. So Renown is going to come from all those different things you do. And each zone has one. So if I come up here, Scott's Glen, I'm much lower. So I'm only at about tier two, but I kind of ended it where I wanted. I'm a little bit into tier three by the time I finished. I got my potion capacity. A lot more to explore here. But, you know, I overdid this area until I figured some things out, which I'll explain here in a sec. A couple more things generally about the game. Now, this one is kind of a pacing tip. This is a massive game, but you also notice you're not going to get too much higher than 50 until you beat the campaign, get to world tier three and all of that stuff. So what I recommend to make sure you don't like burn yourself out doing every little side quest and thing in every zone, you were, you would be 50 long before you finish the campaign. Now, if you want to do that, that's totally up to you. I'm not going to stop you. It's your call. But... What I will tell you is, if you want a reasonable pace, my recommendation is kind of what I did up here in Skaz Glen. I did the campaign. Uh, I found some decent altars of Lilith as I was running around near the campaign stuff that I did. Uh, I got some of the waypoints. Those were done. I probably did like one or two dungeons if there was something class specific for my rogue that I actually like, or I bumped into one specifically. I think I literally did this one, but that was about it. And you'll know you've done it because it's got the little chest next to it for rewards. Like, that's a rogue one I didn't do because it's buried in the corner. Um, I need to apparently go turn in a side quest there. But the idea is getting to here. And the way I would recommend doing it is do as much focus as you can on the story itself. Focus the story. Focus on the golden quests. Like, you'll see the golden quests here. Focus on those and try and knock those out. Now, if you do a public event when you run to the next quest... Sure. If you do a cellar as you're running by, cool. Pick up some altars of Lilith that are, you know, close proximity to where you're going. Bonus. All of that stuff's fine, but I would not go do every single side quest, every little thing, every dungeon. I would try and focus on the golden path, see how far you get between what you naturally bump into on the way. And then if you get to about tier two, cool. If you're one of those who wants the tier three skill point, that's fine. But I think you're going to have more experience than you need to pace yourself correctly. So I recommend like do the campaign. And then if you need to do say anything else to kind of bump up your renown, do one stronghold, like go look on the map that I told you guys about, go find a stronghold. And if you need to bump yourself up to tier two, then cool. I think that's going to get you a reasonable pace because the campaign is going to get you some renown already. Uh, as you work through areas discovered and altars of Lilith and, you know, stronghold. And if you need anything else, strongholds are a quick bump to get you there without knocking out a whole bunch of other stuff. So that's my recommendation for pacing. Get about tier two on each area. Focus on the golden path because you have a lot of acts to go through. And you don't want to be like level 49 when you're finished with act two and then just be hanging out at level 50-ish for quite a while. Because the scaling goes from like maybe four or five hundred thousand for like level 49 when you go from 50 to 51 you're talking millions so things slow down really hard too and that's one of those it's not going to feel as great as you're going through the campaign so pace yourself try not to burn out each zone save plenty of stuff for later and when you get your horse mount 
a lot of stuff will go faster later on too. That way you don't, that's what I'm saying, you don't need to find every altar of Lilith, do every dungeon and every side quest, because anything you gotta do between, you're gonna be able to cover that ground much, much faster once you get your mount later on in the story anyway. So, stick closer to the path and I think you'll be happier. Now, speaking of path, when you get to level 15, there's one detour I'm gonna rec recommend that you make, and it is your specific class quests. For my rogue, it was kind of up in this upper region up here. I know some of like the Barbarian or other things are going to be in other regions. I think the Barbarian and Druid are in separate places. That's the only time I'm going to tell you to go march to another area. Because what it does is it unlocks your specializations. Now, one of mine unlocked at level 30. So I had to wait for that one. But they really change up your character. And getting them at 15 lets you really get a feel for them, which one you want to play. And they can really help your build. Like for me, if I spend 100 energy... My ultimate skills cooldown is four seconds less. Using an ultimate resets the cooldowns of your skills. But one thing that I use literally damn near nonstop is rapid fire, and it is 25 energy. Every four times I shoot that, my ultimate comes back quicker. So that is like a build I have because I get my death trap soon, and then I get this one. And everybody has different specializations that work in different ways. This is just the rogue. But whether it's the druid, barbarian, sorceress... Necromancer, like necromancers are noticeably different as well, depending on your builds. Go find your specialization. Once it hits 15, you may not realize, like you may be playing through the campaign and story and you may not notice it quickly, but around 15, you're going to find that quest that shows up. It's going to kind of have like a little gray spot somewhere. And if it's like rogue specific, that's the one you need to do. If it's barbarian, druid, sorceress, or necromancer, find where that quest is and knock it out. That's the one detour I do recommend is your specialization one because it is well worth it to give your character its full potential. So at around 15, look for that quest. If it's not too far away, go find it. And if it is farther away, I wouldn't worry too much because most of this whole area, at least this top zone, is going to scale to you anyway. So if you're marching over here at 16, you're still only going to be facing about level 16, guys. Nothing is going to be too nuts in this area or up here, I think. So when you are looking for that opening, like, level 15 class-specific quest, you shouldn't get absolutely pummeled on the way to it, I don't think. So if you do, sorry, mine was in this zone. I know three are in this zone. I think the Barbarian and the Druid are out of it, just because we noticed that in the open beta. Um, three are in Kyovishad, two are out here. But either way, it's worth wandering. And again, use the online map, find yourself a waypoint for later. And that way, if you need to travel to that zone for, like, a future act or quest, bam, you've already got it unlocked. So, if you do make a trek outside the zone, make sure, even if, like, maybe your quest is only here, go a little farther and get one waypoint at a minimum. I promise, it's worth it. So, get your class specialization quest. Big, big deal. Now, one thing to note about the campaign. When you beat the campaign with your first character, you can choose to skip the whole campaign with your second character. Now, you're going to start at a lower level, but you're going to have some basic stuff unlocked. You're going to have some of the skill points. You're going to have your benefits from Altars of Lilith unlocked. And you're going to be able to travel around. Your mount's going to be, I think, should be unlocked as well since you finished the story. And you won't have to play through it all again. If you want to, that is up to you. But it is not necessary. So it depends on how you want to play. But at that point, you're going to have some more benefit and things for experience. So you'll level yourself up pretty quickly. But when you make alternate characters, just know you can skip the campaign easy to do and it costs you nothing so it's a totally optional thing it's a nice way to move on to the next character or work on getting an alternate character leveled up faster now when it comes to your gear i want to tell you one thing straight up your legendary gear do not salvage it and do not dismantle it especially early on now the main reason is what you're going to be able to do later on is you're going to be able to take the intrinsic ability. And when you get to a legendary piece of gear, it's the stuff in the orange text. You're going to be able to take that and put it on another piece of gear later on. Now, certain aspects, which is like what those things are, are able to go on certain slots. But you are able to take a, a literally right here, the text, take it off of your legendary gear and put it onto something in the future. Level will not matter, you're just literally going to extract that. So I literally have one of my stashes full of all my legendary gear because at some point, basic skills grant 20% damage reduction for six seconds. That is a very basic thing that I can use. That could be a universal thing, to be honest with you. And later on, you're able to actually take that 
and put it on a future piece of gear. The cost is not cheap, but the functionality is the same, whatever level it goes to. And that is why you do not want to delete these. Keep them. Now, if you start getting duplicates, that's where you could break down some. If you get things like that, that's okay. But initially, you're probably not going to see that many of those. So keep them and tuck them away. And that way, if you do get some that are duplicates, like... When you break stealth, you drop, you know, you drop a cluster of stun grenades. There's a build that I haven't tried that I know that's going to be good for later on. Twisting blades is a thing. While unstoppable. Like, there's so many of these aspects. Some only come from items, too. Like, you'll notice if you look on the map and I go do this rogue dungeon. I'm going to get damaging an elite enemy with a basic skill generates three energy. It's a very generic, but a very basic rogue-specific aspect. Now, the aspects that you get from gear though that's going to be the same orange text but some aspects only come from gear so anything that is legendary whether it's a piece of arm like you know i've got these two over here I've got this one on me now if i out level them at a point i'm going to tuck that away in the vault and keep it so please make sure you do not delete legendaries because their functionality is far better than breaking them down when you are at a higher level and you start getting more legendaries and those tend to be more common that's where you can start breaking them down for materials from salvage or selling them if you need some money. But for the for basically the whole campaign, keep every legendary you've got. Do not delete them. The next thing to note is m kind of money and what to do with your gear as you pick it up. You get a whole bunch of loot all the time. What do you do with it? Well, at a low level, my recommendation most of the time, whether it's blue, you might get a yellow piece and you're like, cool, you're going to out level stuff, by the way. So don't hold on to it forever just because it's yellow. Because notice what I'm currently equipped is 777 damage per second. What I had equipped is 638 damage per second. And it had actually been upgraded a little bit, which I'll cover in a second too. But the idea is when you're making that big of a leap in damage per second, like we're talking 100 or something, when you get some noticeable jumps, it's time to let the old gear go. So what do you do with it? When you're at low levels and then when you get to mid levels about where I am, 30s, 40s, stuff like that, you can start going... 50 50 so you get some gold out of it i recommend honestly breaking stuff down a lot because what you're going to do is you're going to break stuff down and you're going to get a little bit of material from it now blue that i can sell for five thousand gold right now well when i have eight hundred thousand, isn't that valuable but if early on you break down and dismantle a lot of blues you're going to have plenty of the supplies that you need for upgrades because you'll notice if i want to upgrade this it's going to cost me some rawhide, which some of that you'll find out in the world. Or if I want to upgrade a weapon, it's going to cost me iron chunks, which you'll find out in the world as well. Then you'll find silver ore, or you're going to find veiled crystals, which you only get these by breaking down yellow items. So as you break down items, you're going to be getting materials that you need later on. But if you do this early on in the game, the value of the items you're breaking down, like if I come over here and I'm going to sell... You know, this yellow piece, it's worth 11,000 gold. Well, for a new player, that sounds exciting. For me, that's not that big of a deal. But if you're, if you're going to, like, break down a yellow and it's only worth, like, 500 because it's a very low-level item, woohoo, no big deal. 500 gold means nothing, but the material I get from it is the exact same thing. So early on, I recommend breaking down damn near everything. Then when you get to a point where you're like, all right, I want to start stocking up on some gold. Hey, you get your inventory full, then you can go through and do, like, half of it to a vendor. And then break down half of like the stuff you're going to get rid of. Do half and half so you start building up both still keeping materials going and then also building up gold. If you feel like you're low on gold, sell it all. Feel like you want some materials, break it all down. But early on, especially for your first like 25 levels, honestly, the gold you get naturally, you don't need to spend it often. And if you break down literally every piece of gear that you get, when you mess with upgrades later on, you're not going to have to worry about the materials you need for that for quite a while. So early on, break it all down, salvage it all at the blacksmiths. You'll find those frequently. Try not to start selling stuff until things become more valuable. And then go for a 60-40, 50-50, whatever split you want. But, you know, start balancing it. So you still keep building the material supplies, but you also start building up some gold. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is the blacksmith upgrades. And you'll notice a lot of my stuff has these little, like, pips on it. These little, like, right down here, these two, two out of three. Legendary to two out of four. Now, if you take a piece of blue gear, and I want to level it up. So blue, you can only take up to level two. Yellow, you can take up to level three. Legendary, you can take up to level four. And there's even a tier beyond that you get to down the road. But the idea is, the first level is very, very cheap. 
like rawhide. You literally get basic leather by killing beasts in the wild, and it costs me 960 gold. Like, literally nothing. Doesn't matter the level of the weapon, or the level of it. It's cheap as can be. And what it does is you'll notice it gives me a little more armor, and a little more to the stats that I've got. It's not usually going to give you another rank, like, another rank to an ability. Those are usually pretty locked, but... A little bit more for basically next to nothing after a while. Especially if it's like, hey, I just got a new piece of gear. Like, I got this bow. Recently. And I'm thinking about going to this one. So this is why. Like, this one is what I had for a little while. Had two upgrades in it. Decent. But when I got this new one, I went ahead and just upgraded it twice. Because, for one, it was already 100 better. And now it's like 130 better. And it is not that expensive to level it up. Now, the one thing I will tell you is I will not take them to tier 3. Main reason is, when you take things to tier 3, you start spending Veiled Crystals. The only way you get Veiled Crystals, breaking down yellow stuff. Now, you do see a lot. Notice I've got 88. But I really tend not to spend those. It's rare if I do. Now, if I want to take my Legendary, notice that. Right, there's a tier after that. So there's a currency I probably don't even have yet. I could level this thing up, but it's not like really my favorite like bonus it's just got some nice stats right now so i'll take it to tier two it's cheap it's just going to use superior leather and rawhide superior leather um can be obtained from various beasts in the wild same thing here you get those just as you play through and just pick them up like you're gonna kill beasts pick up the leather cool it's just gonna happen quite frequently so every so often i will upgrade these now i don't do it for a while because some of this stuff, early on, you're going to level so frequently, get gear so often. Do, don't do this in the beginning. When you start to hit, like, mid-20s, round 30, every so often you're like, hey, I got a decent pair of boots. And it's a great thing for my build. Like, attack speed, all stats, willpower, it's kind of generic. But if I find something that's specific to, like, my build, it's a benefit to dexterity, distant enemies, crowd control, vulnerable damage. Like, that is literally everything that I'm functioning in my build right now. Spending a little bit of upgrades on it just makes it last that much longer and you are a little bit stronger. So I'd, And you can do the same thing for rings and you can do that over at the jeweler. Again, spend as much or as little as you want. It's up to you. But that's kind of one of those like don't be afraid to do these basic little upgrades initially because honestly like the price it is like ooh 10 rawhide and 960 gold. Ooh, another 10 rawhide and then three leather for another 2,000 gold. Like, I don't, you, I wouldn't even know that I did that, honestly. Later on, I'll forget. And it spent, like, whole 3,000 gold. And now it's a little stronger, a little better on my stats. It just is a nice thing you can do. Not that expensive. I'm not saying do it on every piece all the time. But if you get a piece that you feel like synergizes with your build pretty well and you want to live on it a little bit longer, do it. I don't think it's the end of the world. Now, I will say on the other side... Gem sockets, I don't really use those right now. Now you can, it's totally fine if you want to. I mean, it's not the end of the world. If you get rid of some of the low stuff, you're probably gonna be seeing a lot of gems as we go through. But if you wanna keep your gems so you can like upgrade those later on, it's up to you what you do with gems. I just bought a stash and literally only keep gems in here. You start getting tier one, then we're gonna get tier two, and then probably once you get to tier world tier three, you're gonna start getting the next level up and then you can craft and put them together and eventually get like, perfect gems which you probably only have to craft but the idea is they give you some decent benefits but you know armor the low level you get two percent to maximum life that's not bad but i mean is it really worth an a weapon for four percent damage over time ten percent basic skill damage seven percent ultimate they're not bad but again you're going to be going through so many pieces of gear you're not going to get long-term life out of this thing and the amount of money it actually costs to pull those out like, I had two gems in a piece of, um, in this bow. It was 11,000 gold just to pull them out of there. Because I knew I was probably not going to be using this thing anymore. So I was like, why would I? I don't want to get rid of, I don't want to lose the gem. So I'll pull them out. But then it's just cost to do that. So my recommendation, unless you really feel like you just absolutely are going to find massive benefit from it. Or you feel like you're just struggling and can't get a better piece of gear in some slot. And you do have a slot. Or a socket. You could, but just know it's generally not going to be something that matters that much because you're likely to get new gear that's going to make it obsolete in a little while. Then you got to unsocket it. So my recommendation, probably don't socket early on or just be OK losing the, the low value gems because sometimes pulling them back out is not worth it. Now, this is your alchemist. 
you, I think you literally have to go here for a quest anyway. But the thing I will tell you is, don't forget if you're playing through, because you're going to have your weak healing potion first. It does not do much. At level 10, you're going to get a little icon down here next to your potion. It's going to have a little up arrow. It's going to be a reminder to come back here, and you can level up your health potion. Now, your health potion is typically going to require some of the, like, well, the alchemy materials, the plants that you see. So what I recommend is as you run around for both upgrading your gear, upgrading your potions on all that stuff, you'll be running around and you'll see plants on the ground. You'll see iron ore things. You may just want to sprint by them, but if you take the little two seconds it takes to pick those things up as you go through here, you're really not going to be that short on the upgrades. Like I've never had an issue upgrading to the next level, even this one in this one. And this one is where I stop. I literally run out of things that I need for the level 80 to 80 potion. I'm good for a while. So I've just run around and picked up enough stuff. It's just easy for me to get to. So you may as well. You're just going to be running around. If you see a plant, take that half a second, grab it. Same thing if you see an ore thing, click on it, get the iron ore, get the silver ore. All It just makes those upgrades a literal no-brainer when you have enough of the currency. But make sure level 10, level 20, level 30, level 45... All of these up to the campaign, they really do make a difference in how much health that you get. Because, like, level 10 is a 48 health and then 35% life. You're like, man, that doesn't sound like a lot. You're weak in the beginning. <clears throat> level 20 is literally almost double the health and then the 30% more. Then you go to 141, almost double, 255. Not quite double, but you're, I mean, they are substantial upgrades to your health potions. And then the 35%, it, like builds afterwards always usually gives you a bit more but yeah upgrading your health potions is massive but make sure you're picking up any of the plants you run by while you do and they're pretty easy to spot they're the little plants they have a little bit of a glow to them you run by and grab those things and you'll notice them kind of in each zone when you see them it's worth picking up every time but make sure you upgrade your health potion big thing now another thing when it comes to potions any potion that you use all of them are always going to give you an experience buff of five percent for 30 minutes it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you get to the point where you can make an elixir, doesn't matter which one, like the iron barb elixir, for example, you'll notice the gallivine and bite berry. You're going to see those everywhere as you're roaming around this opening area. I have a lot of those resources. So every 30 minutes, I can pop one of those potions. I have 10 of them. So I'm literally good for five hours of playing if I want extra experience. And honestly, when it comes to experience, it's not a bad thing for especially later on early, not as big of a worry. If you're playing in a party, you get a bonus on experience as well. But if you're playing solo and you want a bonus to experience, so you're playing in the higher end content, this will help you as well. And the cheapest elixir is this iron barb elixir. So it's one that you can stock up on. Some of these get pretty specific. This one, for example, it's one that I have like six of something. So there are a ton of elixirs. The cheap one, way down here in the bottom. Weak Iron Barb Elixir, use that, get your 5%. If you know you're just going to be like, I'm going to be grinding quests and stuff for a while, pop one on. If you know you're like looking your inventory for the next 30 minutes, yeah, don't do that. But if you're like, all right, I'm set up, I'm going to go out in the world, I'm going to do quests, dungeons, everything for a while, 5% 5 experience, it's going to add up. I did want to point this out as well, because please save your money. If you buy something at a vendor, honestly, you're going to find something probably better later on. Now, granted, this is a decent upgrade. Poison, Frozen, Chilled, like, that might be a decent build. This one, Overpowered, Damage to Daze, Ultimate Skill, <clears throat> Damage Over Time, Critical, Ultimate. That's actually one that would fit me pretty well. But it is 265,000 gold. It's literally a quarter of my gold for one item. And I promise you, you're eventually going to find a decent item out there. Please save your money. Don't buy any of this crazy expensive stuff from the vendors. It's generally never worth it because as you're leveling up, you're going to find a drop that's going to be reasonable enough and save your gold. Like, it's just not worth spending it on stuff like this. Now, in Kyovashad, there is a vendor down here in the bottom, the Purveyor of Curiosities. And what you're going to have is a currency called Obels. And what you do is this is kind of like your gambling situation. You get the Obels from like public events. If you see a little orange circle... And it asks you to do a certain objective like defend these people or kill these guys. There's usually some little mechanic that's going on with each one. You finish those. If you do it well, you get like 40. If you do it, you know, mediocre, you're going to get like 20. But you get those kind of all over the place from those like world events that you do. And what you're going to do is if you come to her, 
you're going to have the option to basically roll the dice with some of the currency on a slot. So I could try and go for a sword or a dagger or a bow or a crossbow. And it's usually class specific. Like I'm not going to be getting giant two-handed axes or anything in here as an option. Uh, two-handed weapons are 75. One-handed weapons are 50. They're expensive. Down here, all of the armor is 40. Jewelry is not cheap either. Then you have whispering keys. My recommendation, always have a few whispering keys on you. They're cheap first. So it's one of my early recommendations that your currency is not going to be wasted. You don't need to stock up on like 20 of them. Just have like a few. But the reason is this has a capacity cap. Now, as you get Altars of Lilith, you'll bump this up a little bit here and there because some of them will bump that up by like five. I don't know what my total cap is right now. It might be like 520, 25 or something. Who knows? But it starts at about 500 for a cap. So if you're somewhere in the 300 obols range, 350, 400 especially, if you start getting close to that cap, come here and just roll the dice. And I promise you, you'll occasionally get something good, but you also can have a really crappy streak. Now, I don't have enough to show you, but say my lowest item is 464, 511, 466, and I'm looking at the power level, not so much the pluses. So I know... Yeah, my boots and my gloves are pretty low. So, and I would only do it on armor. I wouldn't do this on weapons or jewelry because just the times that you roll the dice, generally not as efficient unless you're just really in the end game or something. It's up to you. But early on, when you're just trying to find something to spend them on, spend them on some armor. Find your lowest piece and say it's like, okay, boots, come over here and spend 40 on boots. Now you could get like a gray, a blue, a blue, a yellow, a gray, and you may not be that lucky, but every so often you are going to get either a rare kind of early on. That's a nice bump. And then sometimes you're going to get yourself a legendary. It's where I literally got this one from. I dumped all my obels in and my last chest piece, it gave me a big drop. Now it's nice because it's got like trap skill damage, stats, damage, lightning resistance. I, my build isn't so much for like stealth and dazed at the moment, but just the stats alone and the armor bump. Cool. And if nothing else, again, it's a legendary that I can save, pull the aspect out of later for a future build. So this is what your obols are for. You get a cap of 500 at start, slowly goes up. But if you're in that about 300 range, spend some. There is no reason not to because you never really want to get to a point where you're full. Biggest thing I can tell you. So if you're running with friends, doing a lot of public events and stuff like this, come back every so often, roll the dice. And you may feel like you wasted a lot, but if you get to a point where you can't pick it up, you're also wasting it then. So spend a decent amount every so often. Do like three or four. If you don't get anything, eh, not your day. Come back the next day, spend like four or five, and you get like a legendary in a yellow. Cool. Bonus. All that's that's all this is, is every slot, slot specific. And then just, you know, make sure you got some whispering keys so when you're out in the wild and you find a silent chest, it's the only way to open them. So always make sure you have a few. Now, another thing you can do is as you level up, some stuff's going to be generic. Some stuff is going to drop literally for other characters, like a two-handed scythe. That is a necromancer weapon. But what you can do is actually save some occasional items for other characters because sometimes just a little bit of a level bump, sometimes the stuff that you get to drop, like I'm level 45, and sometimes you'll get stuff that drops at 35 or 38. It's hard sometimes to get stuff dropping at your level. So the fact that I've got a level 24 staff here for a sorcerer probably is going to be one of those things that when my sorcerer hits 24 and I can go grab this from my stash, it's actually going to be really beneficial because... The way the level of gear drops versus your level, this is would be a substantial bump, and it's here. So save occasional pieces. Like, I mean, do I need boots for a rogue? Do I need to save? Probably not. I don't need to keep those anymore and these. But weapons, occasionally get some for other characters. Those are an easy save because I don't even think about it. It's like, well, I can't use it, so I know somebody else will. So if I ever have another character and they get to this level, it's probably going to be a decent bump because of what it's capable of doing for that character. And then also random things like jewelry, things like resistances and maximum, like maximum energy. That's a rogue specific thing. So that's not as helpful, but damage to close damage over time, damage to distant, depending on what I'm doing, these are going to be helpful for every character. So if I have like rings that I can share with them that are useful throughout their leveling process, it's not a bad thing to save some stuff over time. Now, early on, not a huge benefit, but I mean, if you think about saving, like, here's a level 10 item, and a 15, and it's 20. If you kind of space some stuff out that you can save for your other characters to kind of trade around and use, it's going to help them be stronger as you go through. So just an idea to save some stuff for future characters, because you can skip the campaign, and then as you level up, bam, you got a nice piece of gear waiting for you. 
it's always helpful to have some uh, some goodies waiting for you as you level up because you never quite know how your drops are going to go. Helps to ease that process along. And the final thing I want to tell you is your abilities. Now, two things about your abilities that I'm going to tell you. One, generally in each section, like you've got a basic skill that is like your freebie that you can cast forever until you're blue in the face. Then you're going to have a certain type of skill. Then I've got like agility skills. Then I've got subterfuge skills. You notice I've only got one selected per each. Now, anything that else is bonus selected over here is from gear. But you only have six slots. So if I'm going to go down the row, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. You have six slots, and that literally is one for each tier that you get to. Now, you've got some passive abilities that you can upgrade and other things that you can do to help those out. You can take each ability farther into its tiers to get the benefits from it. That's totally fine. But the big thing is, when you're going to make any type of build, and this is not a, a guide about builds, but as you're leveling up, focus on that one aspect and then work on passives. Like, I found my Heart Seeker first. I'm like, okay, did a couple of passives, and then I got down here. Okay, then I leaned into Rapid Fire. I got the benefits for enhanced rapid fire and improved rapid fire. May not have got me down there. Maybe I did one passive and then come down here. Really focus on an ability. Pick which branch of the ability you want to upgrade. And then work your way down the tree with passives that are going to find some general benefit to whatever you're doing. And again, you can go back up and get this passive and this passive. This passive, these passives. Just check what is helping your build as you go through every character and every build is going to be pretty different. But the other thing to know is don't worry about picking it too badly because you can go through and I can refund this one and be like, oh, it's 1,200 gold. Oh no, I've refunded it and I'm totally broke. No, it's not. I could refund the entire thing and it's 60,000 gold. Now it's a lot. I don't want to do that all the time, but I could go play for a little while, get that gold back pretty easily, especially if I just... And this is a point where maybe if you like need to respec and you want to mess around with a different build... Well, if you go run around in the world and sell all of the stuff that you get, if I sell some yellows and I need 60,000 gold, six yellows would do that for me right now. And I'm done. I'm good. Like, that's why I was like, <coughs> gold should not be an issue. And therefore, when you're going through your leveling process, my recommendation, don't feel bad about respecking. If you pick, and I did this one in the open beta, so I figured it out. But I was like, okay, so I picked puncture. Throw blades a short distance, dealing 165 damage. Every third cast slows enemies by 20% for two seconds. This is my freebie. Okay, I picked that one or this one doesn't matter. Then I came down here and I was like, okay, barrage. Unleases a barrage of five arrows that expands outwards, each dealing, you know, a chunk of damage. Each arrow has a 20% chance to ricochet off an enemy up to one time. Ricochets deal 40%. I was like, cool. But one thing I noticed as a solo player, I really didn't have a way to focus damage on a boss this wasn't like this was a little rough when i swapped to rapid fire it was a game changer for my current setup and i've been using that for most of my run through the campaign so if you feel like something just isn't working you just have to refund enough points to be able to get back here so like i can't refund this i mean i can because it's high levels but i can't refund certain ones because they may re be required for me to be at a certain tier um so keep that in mind as you spend certain points you'll get down here. And I've spent enough that like I can get to the bottom tree. But when you're specking early on and maybe I want to change this one to this one. Well, I might have to refund this, 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 this. And then these to be able to put these here and then come back down here again. So you may have to like backtrack a few steps. But even if you do at an early level, it's so cheap. Doesn't matter. Just dan dance around in, the, in all of your abilities. See what works. See what doesn't. And honestly, don't ever fear respecking. It's cheap enough that you could go run around, do like, run around, go do a dungeon, sell the gear that you get out of doing a dungeon or two, and you'd be fine. So really respec anytime you want, experiment with builds, see what works, see what feels good. If something's not working, try something else. Now, when you get later on and I've got like, I've got things that are leaning into poison trap and I've got something that's probably going to give me... You know, I've got trap skill damage. Maybe I'm not going traps on a build in the future and my gear isn't quite as efficient. Well, then, you know, crank the world tier down for a little bit, experiment, mosey around, and then when you kind of get back and settled into what you're doing, then you can bump things back up. But respec anytime you want to. Later on, obviously, you'll figure out that it's going to be a little more costly, but it's not the end of the world. So mess with your abilities, respec, 
and just try to try to focus an ability down. Like, I mean, don't go like you don't want to pick this, 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 and this. Like these are all basic abilities, and you fill up this entire thing. It's kind of pointless. One in each major node, and then work on your you know passive bonuses, and then lean into also as you you know you need a few points to get down to each node. So then it's like if you do this one, pick your enhancers for each ability, then maybe bump up the ability. Like rabbit hits working really well for me, so I'm gonna lean really heavily into that one as I work my way down. So that's my recommendation, just on a general sake for builds and respecking. And don't be, don't be afraid of spending the gold. You're going to get plenty of gold. And I think that puts us at 20. Now, there probably will be more things that I come up with when we get to mid-game or end-game and stuff like that later on. Maybe there's build guides that I put together as I play through more. But as an initial video just on this channel, hopefully you guys do enjoy this one. Those are some tips as I've gone through that helped me, like upgrading stuff. Not the end of the world. Maybe I didn't waste gems on sockets. Maybe you do. Not the end of the world. But like the waypoints, the altars, using the pin on the map, which I didn't know until somebody told me in like the open beta. And I was like, oh my God, that's a game changer. Oh, one other thing. When you go to a dungeon, if you hit your emote wheel, you can leave a dungeon by literally clicking like your emote wheel and clicking leave dungeon. Now, I don't remember if it tells you that specifically and you can't do it in certain campaign spaces. You can't exit the dungeon that way. But if you're just in a normal dungeon where it's like, hey, I want to go get this aspect over here. I do this dungeon. I'm in the boss room. Well, sometimes you can actually click on the stairs of the map and it'll let you leave. But the other one is just the emote wheel, leave dungeon. You're good. You're out of there. You're right back at the top. And then sometimes there's also like riddles and it's going to tell you, hey, maybe there's something you need to do for a universal sign of thanks or cheer or com like show camarader camaraderie, whatever it is. Sometimes those riddles are based around your emotes. And sometimes you might need to go find an emote because there's more emotes than are actually on that wheel. So just a piece of advice. Um, and that's what most of this was. This is my advice from playing through. I'm up to act five and I don't know how much is exactly left in the story, but these are things I figure everybody's going to find beneficial as things go public this evening for all of you. I hope the servers handle it well. They handled it well for all of us in early access with like a couple of minutes, but then public goes live tonight. So servers are going to be busy and popping. So if you guys are enjoying these videos for me, hit that subscribe, hit the alert bell so you see my future videos. And if this one does well, hopefully we'll see some more Diablo 2, con Diablo 4, sorry, content on this channel, which I also cover a fair amount of Destiny 2 as well. So thank you guys very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed this one and I will see you in future videos. Come hang out on Twitch as well. I'm over there quite a bit.